everyone for coming to this event tonight. Um, it's being hosted by the Classicist Affiliated Society, um, from which you just tied to Kurt Goldsmith. Uh, and we have, we host events, um, we have a weekly coffee break and reading group. Um, so our next coffee break is tomorrow uh, in Locust Cafe in Goldsmith at 6pm. And we hold a reading group on a Monday night um, in Goldsmith um, in room 257. Uh, yeah, after this, we're going to head to the New Cross House for a drink, so feel free to join us. Um, and feel free to take um, any of our PRs. We have a, week, like a monthly uh, kind of PR that we release, um, and they're on the table there. So you can each take one on your way out. Um, so tonight, we're hosting a panel on the question of art in the commodity form. Uh, and we have the three, oh yeah, Alan Woods, who is also um, down to attend tonight, is unable to make it. Um, but we have the three panelists here, um, who I will who will introduce, uh, and then I'll read the um, the panel description with questions, and then allow for each panelist like uh, ten to twelve minutes um, opening remarks, and then chance to respond to one another, and then we'll open up questions from the audience. Um, okay, so we have uh, Rex Dunn, uh, who's an independent Marxist. Uh, in the 1990s, he studied history, theory, and practice of photography at the University of Westminster, then the University of Derby. Uh, hence his close interest in the relationship between Marxism and art uh, in the age of mass media. Uh, he has his own website and is also an occasional writer for The Weekly Worker, which is um, a newspaper published by the Communist Party of Great Britain. Um, and next we have Zoe Granger, who uh, was born in New Zealand um, and is currently the director of Arcadia Mystic Gallery, which is based in Peckham in South London. I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, and then we have Peter Osborne, who's Director of the Centre for Research in Modern European Philosophy at Kingston University, London, and is a long-time editor of the journal Radical Philosophy. Uh, his books include The Politics of Time, Modernity in the Avant-Garde, Philosophy and Cultural Theory, Conceptual Art, Marx, and Anywhere or Not at All, Philosophy of Contemporary Art. And now I'm just going to read the panel description out um, in case people don't have a chance to read it. Um, and then also the questions. Can everyone hear me okay at the back? That's fine. Okay. Um, so if it is true that the commodity structure is the defining feature of modern capitalism down through the present, then it stands to reason that it has no less impacted the way that art is produced, consumed, circulated, and exchanged. This shift in art's character happened both objectively e.g. as an article produced for exchange on the market, and subjectively, i.e. as a kind of experience and form of expression for the social and individual body. However, art's relationship to its status as a commodity is an ambivalent one. Art has become at once, art has become at once more free from past forms of domination, but in its freedom is constrained when the sub... Uh, sorry. In its freedom is constrained when, the sub when subject to the dynamics of capital. Art as a commodity is both its pure and its poison and has evolved into a social problem for its practice. Since becoming aware of this problem, artists, philosophers, curators, and critics have taken various approaches in seeking to overcome it. How has art under a capitalist society changed from its pre-capitalist practices? What is the commodity form, and what is art's relationship to its logic? Must art seek emancipation from the commodity form, or is it at home in it? In what sense does art take part in the left and emancipatory politics, if at all? By asking these questions, this panel seeks to reinvestigate art's relationship to commodity form and make intelligible how this problematic relationship still sticks with us today. Um, and so maybe we'll start from with with Rex Dunn, and then if that's okay, um, great. So yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, well, thank you very much for inviting me to talk to you this evening. Um, it's good to see a, a really good turnout. Um, now, I'm probably going to be uh, the one who's going to be a catalyst for an awful lot of arguments, so please be prepared for that. Um, as a classical Marxist myself, I would say that we are an endangered species, and therefore we need to be protected and then reintroduced into the social environment before it's too late. On a more serious note, I would like to uh, distinguish between a Marxist theory of the aesthetic, which I think is both possible and necessary, and the so-called Marxist aesthetic, which is pres prescriptive and against the freedom of art. That is something that I have nothing to do with, so I'll just say that before I start. Okay. I have divided my talk into eight points. 
and uh, they are based on my reading of Marx, and that is, I see Marx, uh, Marx's writings as an integral uh, project, and also I have, um, I'm thankful also for the uh, critical theorists, I dip into their ideas as well. So point number one. I'll be using language that you may not be familiar with, but hopefully you will bear with me and follow me through to the end. Point number one. The bourgeois epoch introduced the making and appreciation of impractical art objects which can be valued for themselves as well as perform a social function. Aesthetic structure is indispensable to the work of art. This is achieved through the unity of form and content. The artist experiments with form in order to express the content of the artwork. It is a basis of aesthetic labor or the free play of man's physical and psychic faculties. It's the driving force of the human desire for freedom and fulfillment. By so doing, the artist is able to establish his or her individuality or style and point of view. Aesthetic labor is therefore the antithesis of wage labor, which is unfree. Art is subjective from the standpoint of the feelings and thoughts of the creator. In that sense, it is different from philosophy and science, which are based on the objectivity of concepts. The artist should be seen as an unproductive worker, but if he works primarily for the purpose of the accumulation of capital, then he is merely a productive laborer. Given his or her desire for freedom, the artist is compelled to protest against prosaic reality because the latter is exploitative, alienating, and oppressive. Hence, we can speak of art's relative autonomy. Although it cannot escape commodification and ideology, it does come close to disalienation. At least, it is free, or should be free, from the coercion of either the church or state, and hopefully market forces. Therefore, the artist may be seen as the harbinger of homo aestheticus, and this is what I consider to be a positive achievement of the bourgeois epoch. Second point. But the telos, or the final form of art, can only be achieved in a future communist society. The latter will abolish the bourgeois division of labor, or the separation of intellectual from practical labor, which is necessary for the accumulation of capitals. It will also introduce more leisure time, leading to the all-sided development of the whole individual. Only communism can establish the material basis for the development of human power, which is its own end, the true realm of freedom. Thus we will see the emergence of Homo aestheticus on a broader and higher basis, whereby people will be able to engage in painting among other activities. Point number three. Under capitalism, there has always been a tension between art, which gratifies the senses, and the commodity form. But the longer it continues, the survival of art's autonomy is under threat. And I think this is for four main reasons. One, the bourgeois division of labor continues unabated despite the internet. Two, more than ever, the artist needs the imprimatur of the art institution, which is linked to the market. Therefore, art remains a separate realm produced by a remote spectrum of experts. Three, the artist isolates the producer from the consumer, especially the worker. Four, increasingly it reduces art to a mere commodity and therefore degrades it. The tendency is for price to become the determining factor, not the quality of the artwork. The inverting power of money can make black, white, and reason nonsense, and so on. Point number four. Today, the latter is all pervasive due to false consciousness at both the individual and institutional level. <coughs> Compare the early 20th century with the instrumental present, for example, the role of white writing workshops. The heyday of arts autonomy in the form of aesthetic modernism is long gone. That is, the artists who produced impractical art objects based on an inner need to create, not just to live off the fat of the land. Today, alienation goes 
far beyond the drudgery of wage labor, which reduces the worker to a mere machine, including skilled as well as unskilled workers. Thanks to the rise of the new mass media, the commodity form provides the basis for the society of the spectacle, that is, the unreal reality of advertising, news or propaganda, and the entertainment industry. Point number five. How do we get where we are today? The answer is not to be found in technology. The latter in itself is not a determining factor. To find the answer, we need to look at recent history. Arguably, the October Revolution of 1917 occurred at the right time, but in the wrong place. As long as the revolution remained isolated and backward, the victory of the counter-revolution was inevitable. This took the form of the Stalinist bureaucracy, which based itself on the nostrum of socialism in one country. Therefore, the international revolution had to be suppressed. The Russian avant-garde were reduced to the servants of the regime, which went on to murder 20 million people in the name of socialism. The Stalinist interregnum might be over, but it has left a poisonous legacy for human consciousness. <coughs> the social revolution is deemed to be utopian, or it can only lead to barbarism, therefore capitalism is seen as the lesser of the lesser evil. Point number six, getting more controversial as we go along. Stalinism also opened the door to post-war mass consumerism, the mass media, the culture industry, and the society of the spectacle wherein the individual becomes increasingly fragmented and atomized, or suffers from loss of individuality. Hence we see the rise of identity politics against the tidal force of mass culture. But the need for affirmation is largely negative and protective. It leads to institutionalized censorship and even self-censorship. This is reinforced by the internet and the smartphone, although as I say they do not play a determining role, but they are in the hands of large private corporations such as Google and Facebook. Therefore, we have the justification of the conditions and aims of the existing system. A lot of contemporary art is a reflection of this. I'll come back to art if you think I've lost the plot. Point number seven. In the 60s and 70s, this vacuum that was left by the failure of the social revolution was filled by postmodernism, for me, this is shorthand for the corruption of Marxism by late critical theory, structuralism, post-structuralism, and the postmodern theory of art. I would describe this as the logics of disintegration, the overthrow of the grand approach to knowledge, along with the notion of stable forms of reality. Relativism and pluralism ruled in harmony with the market. Hence, we have the engulfing of quality and quantity in the realm of the ascetic, as well as the socio-economic realm. This amounts to postmodernism's reconciliation with late capitalism, rather like Hegel's earlier reconciliation with the same beast, which he then went on to describe as the essential foundation of progress. Thus, the commodity form, commodity fetishism, permeates the whole of society, not just, just during the hours of work, but also during our leisure time. Final point. I hope we've got time to finish it and get to my conclusion. What do you think? Two minutes? Yeah, I can do it in two yeah, minutes. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Enough my time, because he's got like lots of We're both Kiwis, by the way, so we're a bit of solidarity there. Okay. Um, there's another Kiwi in the audience. Might be a few more, who knows? Um, right, point number eight, final point. You won't get many keys, Kiwis saying this sort of thing either, but still, we'll leave it at that. Um, point number eight. Postmodern art privileges conception over aesthetic labor at the expense of four. Therefore, at best, such artworks are only able to critique reality in an ambiguous or ironic way. I would describe this as low-grade art, or not art at all. <laughs> but this is not a new epoch for art as a postmodernist claim. They've forgotten about Dadaism, which at the very least, in the early 20th century, saw itself as a provocation against the bourgeoisie imperialist war, along with the art market, which appropriates everything, including avant-garde art. And yes, my conclusion. <laughs> Today, all this is confusing to the masses, which makes them cynical about art in general, along with the postmodernists themselves. <coughs> art objects acquire an inflated monetary value via the art auction, 
for which the art institution provides an intellectual fig leaf. The story of the emperor without his clothes springs to mind. In a recent interview, the British artist Cornelia Parker reassured viewers that the sale of British art has replaced the manufacturing industry. Note the mindset, even if she was having a bit of a laugh. Hence, at both the conscious and practical level, we see a growing fusion between the artwork and the commodity form, which amounts to the degradation of art in the epoch of capitalist decay. To paraphrase Marx, without the overthrow of capitalism, the decadence of modern art becomes inevitable. Thus, from the standpoint of classical Marxism, of which I am one, a very rare species indeed, so please look after us, art and the commodity form have always been irreconcilable, but never more so. The freedom of art for the revolution, the revolution for the freedom of art. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Okay. So, <laughs> I should correct you. I'm actually half English, half oh, New Zealand. That's okay. Yeah, so my, a lot of my family are from fine. South London. So. Not a nationalist. <laughs> Um, yeah, so in contrast to Rex, I will predominantly be using language that is a lot less academic. I want to engage primarily with what I know as a gallerist and a millennial, focusing on artists. So firstly, I just want to note that there are no represented visual artists on the panel, which doesn't seem right to me, considering we are discussing them. Art doesn't exist without artists, and that mentality is part of a wider disconnect that is something I have noticed happening within the art world in the last few years. I'm sorry, this is just like my voice, so. <laughs> um, I'll try to skip further. Um, sorry. Um, okay, I'm speaking from a very specific point of view. Um, we run a gallery that sits between a project space and a commercial space, is that better? Yeah. Um, meaning we do big art fairs, we just did Freeze last week and uh, Basel, uh, yet we have the freedom to show projects from our community that are exciting to us within a quick, within a quick turnaround. So if we want to work with the young artists to do a residency, we can do that. Um, so most of our, so yeah, and so because we are in Pekin, most of our collectors never come to our gallery. So what will often happen is we have an opening where we have hundreds of our local or wider community um, of sort of artists and people we know, but we won't have collectors coming to openings, um, but we'll deal with them at our fairs. Uh, yeah, so we're kind of sitting in this space which is kind of unique, I think, at the moment. Um, but I think it is definitely the way forward in terms of the way gallery structures should be run um, if you want to have a freedom within your program. Um, the reason why we have this freedom is that we have studios within our gallery space. We, uh, you probably haven't been there, but if you have, we have a large railway arch, and about a third of that is taken up by studios, other studios, which are, just for the record, really well priced within Pekin. Like, they'll stay the same post gentrification. Um, so, anyway, we have positioned ourselves this way as it provides a solution to be bound by sales targets, meaning our artists aren't jeopardizing their integrity or politics, which is really fundamental to our position as a gallery space. So, austerity Britain is not the flush, cocaine, sexy art world of the 80s or YBA 90s. To make a gallery promptly an emerging space work, the amount of labour is intense. <laughs> this is not a complaint, merely a decision on both Roche and I's part. Activities such as painting walls, wrapping up, press admin, all the usual gallery stuff um, is obviously very time consuming and we often don't pay ourselves for it. Because we are also a commercial space, effective labour is takes up most of our time. That means attending dinners, opening event, openings, events every night of the week. Um, or you know, like partying with a collector till four o'clock in the morning. So we're placed in this kind of insane position where we are operating as a commercial space in the way that we are going to events and communicating with people who are going to purchase our artist's work, but we're also running a program of which we like strongly believe in and artists who we, we really treasure and hope to grow with. So, just decide what I'm going to say next. I'm sorry, I haven't really planned this very well. I had friends last week, so I'm kind of tired. Um, something I kind of wanted to touch on was that with kind of with the opposition being in between a commercial space and a project space, we don't like to, I guess, like 
confront, confront the commodity, the work as a commodity, because we have such a personal connection to our artists <coughs> and the work and the politics often behind the work that it's not something we like to do. But what I've noticed even with commercial spaces like the Bozen or like Sadie Coles, even they don't, they won't like directly address the exchange of money for art. So you won't use words like sold or bought. You know, you use words like gotten or so. This it's, it's all this kind of fun like little game where no one's really talking about the exchange, um, which is kind of. <laughs> Insane, and, and 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 I think that that's possibly a good thing, uh, or good or bad. It doesn't matter. I mean, whenever you know we're dealing with our artists, I never want to say, you know, I don't I don't want them to be implicated and make them feel like their work is being sold because it sounds so crass, you know. And it's like this is unsure of what we're going to discuss, but it's it's important for our artists to feel comfortable um, and like whilst retaining their sensibilities you don't want them to it's a form of trust and mutual respect so you don't want them to feel you know like we're commodifying them as human beings um, so something is nothing I've noticed these are all just things I've thought about in the last week whilst I've been a freeze which I thought was like the opportune moment to think about this because I mean, we all know, for especially like an art supermarket, you have collectors just walking around being like, bye, 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 bye. So um, it's a good, I think, place to think about art as a commodity. Um, so something that's happened recently is often artists will have, um, so there'll be, the idea of a patron has changed. So something that I guess has been important with the growth of artists is the idea that there are patrons who provide money or support to artists and that's a really important thing because without money people can't make art so obviously stupid point but yeah um, but what's happened is now we're getting a rise of wealthy collectors children often but also <coughs> collectors themselves or people with a large amount of money who are not creating a foundation which is an excellent you know um, kind of alternative to an institution, or it is in the institution, but it's a nice alternative because it's less uh, bureaucratic. But um, you have these sort of, I don't know, I want to use the term like collector's children, but it's kind of not right, but they've decided that they're going to become curators. And so what happens is you get people who get their parents often, or they use their own money to purchase a large amount of work. Often these would be like, you know, very on trend artists like Sir Ruby or like, you know, big big artists, big contemporary artists, and they'll curate a show and then sell the work to their parents' friends or their friends or and so this leaves kind of this really sad space. You've got basically this work operating in the secondary market which devalues the emerging artists' work. And also it means that you've got a lack of patrons providing money directly to artists so that they can see their work, that they can realise their work, their art. I actually hate the term work when talking about art, it sounds kind of ridiculous, but um, so sorry if I keep saying that. Um, <laughs> uh, another issue as well that is kind of what I was sort of talking about at the start is that I think that a lot of people in the art world, and predominantly I don't want to be like fashion curators because there is a very important space for them <laughs> in the institution, but they are ignoring the voice of an artist and often what will happen after speaking with loads of artists about this, they will so a curator will come to them with their concept and of their show and they will then get the artist to manipulate their vision into, into their, their concept, which is not right. It should be about the artist, it should be about their work, and that's, that's, that's how it should be. It shouldn't be about promoting a, a on-screen curator and giving them fame. Um, also, I wrote something today, um, which was an answer to one of the questions that you wrote. Um, so I thought it was kind of interesting, like when you said, in what sense does art take part in the left and emancipatory politics, if at all? <laughs> um, and you will probably both discredit this. Um, politics of this nature are exclusionary because they are. If any artwork is sold to a Marxist professor or a Russian billionaire, the impact is the same, maybe more powerful in the Russian billionaire's home. So yeah, I've got examples of that, I can't recall going into it. So yeah, 
I think I'm done. I haven't really explained myself much, but... We can come back to it with responses and, and questions. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Thank, thank you. Um, I found myself in the Tom Sobot play in the 1970s. <laughs> Tom Sobot plays in the 1970s. They always have the same kind of structure. They always involved. Uh, Would you like to use the microphone if it's. Uh, I don't really want to stand up, so I'm just going to quickly. Um, they always involved like three or four archetype, social archetypes, which one was always an academic. Uh, one was always some kind of leftist, <laughs> and one was always a kind of society person. But in this case, it's oh, a whole world. It's a whole world and society come together. And what happens in these songs of the plays of the 1970s is they all discuss uh, some morally purposeful topic uh, very seriously, but are all actually obviously comically ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> And yet their moral seriousness in some way redeems them from that absurd comic event. Um, so in, in the spirit of the Tom Sopper play from the 1970s, uh, sure. I will adopt the necessary serious mode in order that I be comic in the correct way. Uh, that means that my language is going to be even more academic. <laughs> See. So I thought what I, would, I would just, in my 10 minutes, uh, run through some responses to some of the questions that are in this panel description, where when I read it through, I wrote no in the margin. So, <laughs> so I, thought, I thought I'd just do that as a kind of uh, uh, top hard professor. Um, and the first one, uh, maybe it is what creates my difference from these two positions, really. Because the description begins, if it's true that the commodity structure is the defining feature of modern capitalism, and I think that the if there is supposed to be rhetorical, I think, because we're supposed to accept that the commodity structure is the defining feature of modern capitalism. Um, but I don't think, uh, from a strictly theoretical point of view, if you were a Marxist, you really ought to believe that. Um, and it's possible that it's the uh, it's the defining heresy of Lukács' history and class consciousness that he did believe that. Uh, and it's possible that the whole of Western culturalist Marxism and its cultural theoretical uh, legacy in non in non Marxist forms follows from this general principle. Uh, however, to say that it's not the defining feature of modern capitalism is not to say that it is not the all-pervasive feature of modern capitalism. Uh, if one thinks about the first sentence of capital, all you need to read actually with respect to this point is the first sentence of volume one. So it's really a short read. Um, thank God. <laughs> one sentence would do in relation to this problem. Um, where Marx talks about the fact that the way in which the world presents itself in capitalism right, is as a vast accumulation of commodities. In other words, the commodity on the well, I don't mean, eminently orthodox uh, position, the commodity is, if you like, the phenomenological form of capitalism. The commodity is the way that you encounter capitalism uh, every day. Because it's commodity exchange which connects everybody up. Uh, and commodity exchange becomes the universal mediation of social relations, but it does not thereby define uh, modern capitalism, because it doesn't define capitalism at all, uh, because there are non capitalist commodity producing societies. Um, and it's because capitalism is not tied to the commodity form in general. My first point, capitalism is not tied to the commodity form in general because there are not capitalist forms of commodity exchange. That the fact that 
for the last 200 years. What we think of as art in the modern Western post 18th century sense of being autonomous and what some people confuse with being aesthetic. Um, the fact that the commodity is the main social form uh, within which such works are exchanged uh, is not, if you like, fatal to them in some capitalistic sense. It doesn't tie them to capitalism in the way in which the defining feature of capitalism would tie them to capitalism. Because the defining feature of capitalism on um, completely orthodox positions, I'm going to, I'm going to out orthodox Rex. Um, we're going to have an orthodoxy fest. Um, the defining, fe- defining feature of capitalism is, of course, not commodification, but it's the commodification of the labor power. It's, it's one specific commodity, the commodification of which uh, leads to capitalism, not commodification of commodification of labour power. And that leads to capitalism because the commodification of labour power leads to surplus and surplus leads to accumulation. And capitalism is a society based on the accumulation of capital. So insofar as art has an intrinsic relation to something called the defining feature of modern capitalism, that would be insofar as it firstly relates to wage labour, or secondly, is a distinct type of capital, which of course it is. Um, it's a special kind of speculative financial capital, which you can track on all the financial sites in the usual ways, like any other uh, form of capital. Um, but the point is, it's not its commodity form, which is, which is the primary issue here, which is why its commodity form is not, uh, is not what is fatal to it. Uh, and that is why, of course, uh, it's because what's fatal is the commodification of labour that the thing that saves art within capitalism from uh, the fate of other forms of labour is that art is generally or not exclusively produced at least in an uh, authorial sense by forms of labour that are not wage labour. There are lots of wage labourers employed by uh, famous <coughs> artists producing their art. Uh, but they don't get to uh, count as the producers of the work. No way to labor, just like everybody else's way to labor. Um, so the, the romantic salvation, if you like, of art within capitalism has always been that art is a form of any commodity production in which artists get to overdetermine the ends of their practices in a way. Uh, which exceeds that of other uh, forms of labour in capitalism. But of course, they don't get to completely um, do that if they want their work to have any social actuality. And generally, artists do want to have their work to have social actuality, although it's important to them to pretend that they don't. Um, and if they want their work to have any social actuality, then it is going to have to enter the nexus of exchange. Um, but it's going to enter the nexus of nexus exchange at the level of circulation, in other words, it's going to acquire the commodity form of circulation, not in production, uh, which is why we have so many parties. Uh, because, if you like, the uh, determination of the economic value of art has to happen wholly within the sphere of circulation. It doesn't happen within the sphere of, <coughs> of production. And so it is open to all kinds of mysterious and pleasurable forms of social determination uh, involving the production of different sort of forms of illusion regarding its symbolic uh, and personal value. Um, so the artist, in other words, on my, what I tend to be a completely <coughs> orthodox view of this, uh, the artist in capitalist society is contradictory located because they're producing in a non-capitalistic manner, a product which if they want to give it any social actuality, but they might not, they can stay at home as well. But if they want to give it any social actuality, they have to enter into the universal medium of exchange, which means that there's a constraint and there's an over-determination of their production, which means that they have to speculatively predetermine the reception uh, of their work insofar as it's going to enter <laughs> circulation. 
And of course, insofar as, you know, now there are different historical ways of coming to terms with and resolving that contradiction. One of them is to pretend that it doesn't exist and ask for gathering gatherers never to use the word soul. No, they don't ask, they just don't do it. It's an unwritten role. You just seem to look into their eyes and you can see that soul is asking for a soul. For you not to remind me about it. The owl doesn't have a soul. Wait, one minute. So the, the traditional resolution of the contradiction it's the neo avant garde resolution of the contradiction, where you, defer, where you speculatively defer the reception of your work. So you produce a work in the present which is unreceivable uh, and doesn't get circulated uh, universally, and consequently retains your independence from art status. But you put a kind of secret into the work, you put a kind of time capsule into the work, which, within which you're Projecting that this your work will become historically intelligible down the line, uh, at which point it can attain social actuality, enter art history, uh, and you can actually be an artist as opposed to an art student who's still using the term artist, um, which is a gray area. Um, and the problem for most contemporary artists is that they're too impatient to do that anymore. And consequently, they have problems about the seriousness, the historical seriousness of their own work, because they want to be historically serious and contemporary in the sense of immediate at the same time. And that's very difficult. Thank you. Thanks. Um, And now if we could take um, take the comments or thoughts from from each uh, panelist. we we'll in the presentations. Um, so, Rexon, if I could start with you. Well, Wait, five minutes for a sec. Yeah. Sponsors. Um, just a question for. Um, so, um, first of all, uh, I, I was very impressed with what you said about um, the the actual way in which. Uh, an art gallery works in relation to the market on the one hand and artists on the other. And some of the things you said I thought were very illuminating. I think I certainly admire your integrity as a gallery owner and your desire to protect the artist. And I think possibly you might agree with what I said about um, uh, what art should be, um, uh, something to do with the human aspiration for freedom and fulfillment. Unfortunately, the artist, of course, has to live, has to make a living, has to feed themselves and their family, and they come up against uh, the market or market forces, and you're trying to soften the blow, so to speak, and I really respect you for doing that. So I don't have any... Thank you. I don't have any real disagreements with what you're trying to do. I admire what you're trying to do. <laughs> and I was also uh, depressed, but at the same time... Uh, 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 did I say impressed? I was impressed, but also depressed by what you said about... <laughs> the, impressed because of what you're saying and you're bringing it to light which is something I didn't know about when you talked about the role of rich collectors children who then when they grow up decide they want to become curators of art shows and then they decide um, what kind of uh, art the artist should be producing and try and manipulate what the artist is doing and that for me confirms the needs of the market First of all, sorry, I should differentiate those two separate things so the first one would be looking at the way, in, yeah, they're two separate. So the way in which the curator can like force an artist to put their curatorial concept for a show, that's different to this new wave of curators who are often like very um, financially well endowed, and yeah. that's so those are like two separate like kind of yeah, sorry, like models. I, but yeah. Sorry, I didn't. Sorry, I, I didn't. I, I, I didn't articulate what I was trying to say. I agree with what you're saying. You expressed it much more clearly than I have. But I find that very, very disturbing. And I, I admire the way you're trying to to try, if you like, soften the blow and to try and deflect from that. Also, I was again uh, impressed with the fact that you're bringing it to the, to the light of this meeting. At the same time, depressed by the information that that you were giving us that I didn't know about. Um, the art, you said that art somehow acquires more power if it is sold to a Russian billionaire as opposed to a Marxist, which I thought was a rather interesting comment. Yeah. Um, well, the, uh, 
my um, so-called academic adversary, I don't really know what to say. I, I, um, I couldn't really follow what you were saying, first of all, um, because you started off with what seemed like a really large tickle in your throat. But um, then you came up with the Tom Stoppard play, which about three speakers, and you decided that, according to Stoppard, they're all morally ridiculous, including particularly the lefties. So I was wondering whether or not you were going to leave it with... Um, a Tom Stoppard play of whether you were insinuating that possibly this happens in real life, I don't really know. Apart from that, I find your comments uh, when you did try to address the commodity form um, extremely abstract and very, very hard to follow, not concretized. And the stuff you said about non uh, societies where the commodity does not play a part, I would say that, that they are very, very few and far between, unless you're going to go to you know, the, the central jungles of New Guinea or South America, you might find people who don't know anything about the commodity form, and they might be producing better kinds of art than we might find um, being supported by people like Cornelia Parker. I think I might buy into that particular <coughs> argument, actually. But um, other than that, I don't really know what you're talking about. Um, when you said there are forms of non-wage labour involved in the process of the making of art, I also find that increasingly hard to believe because nobody, unless it's your wife or your your child or your or your girlfriend or your boyfriend, no one is going to do something for nothing these days. So I don't understand what you mean. But in the end, you contradicted yourself by saying that you cannot escape uh, the commodity form, that sooner or later art will enter into the market and be part of the process of the accumulation of labour. So in a sense, you're contradicting yourself. So I'll, I'll leave it there. I'll just repeat what I said. I think what you're saying is abstract, vague, far too technical, and it's got nothing to do with the real world. <laughs> Take, um... That's amazing, because you're supposed to be the Marxist. <laughs> oh, yeah, you don't know what Marxism is, that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you would like to respond, or if you... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, the record, this is why I don't identify as a Marxist. Just in case you're wondering. There's a lot of, you don't like... don't have to. Loud, white, men. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, what I wanted to say was I really liked the analogy, I don't even really remember the context you used them, but the way you used the term the Empress New Clothes, mm -hmm. because that I think is a very, 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 very important fact when you look at the art market today. You have, uh, in the same way that you look at it in the financial realm, you have art like bubbles that are surrounded by emerging artists. So just, so you know, I am speaking about emerging artists because that's my, what I know. So I'm not talking about, you know, mid-level mid-career artists or super fans of. So anyway, um, that what happens, um, I'm not sure the way you use it, but I like it. So it's like what happens is you get a bubble around the young artist and there's various collectors who will buy a lot of um, a lot of the artist's work and, and really like uh, flood the market with it, um, creating a bubble and then Obviously, that bubble dissipates once that artist, who is often very young, um, is unable to like reach the the levels of fame of which their huge gallery that they just got signed to um, are placing on them. Uh, so yeah, it's very much a matter of like the clothes. Like there is like a lot. There's often a lot of talks, a lot of product um, idea of what what the commodity is, but or art, the artist, but it's not. It doesn't have any strength or or political like political gravitas um, one thing that you said that I kind of disagree with is um, when you said that there's no answer in technology um, I think that personally I, I think and, and well not even personally but a lot of um, our artists use technology in, in, in a way that is super important because it provides an alternative space for freedom, especially for other bodies. So that's queer and bodies of colour who are unable to fit in within like a specific like white heteronormative space. So technology provides um, a yeah a, a, a platform or a cloud for um, a very important conversation. Um, I think, and that can be in terms of an actual online forum space, or it can actually be the technology itself, such as CGI or stuff like that um, yeah I like the way you talk 
Um, this guy. Um, I, I was sort of confused, like, when you were saying, like, how artists aren't engaging with capitalism or the commodity. Like, what about artists who speak directly to capitalist realism? Like, what about artists who are, their, their work is directly related to the way in which they're consumed as a capitalist subject, such as, like, female artists using their body online or in other ways? Like, why can't they be... Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't know what you're talking about, really. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, I, I don't know, like, maybe you can answer that better. So. Yeah, that's really what I had to say. I really want, um, I would really like it if there's artists in the audience to like talk more because we're talking about art, but we're not. Like, we need to be talking about art more now, I think. So, that is a concern, I guess. But, like, we actually need to be talking about it because we're sort of dancing around this idea of like the commodity, we keep calling it the commodity, or, or, or this, it's, it's taking the place, it's just basically a placeholder for a product. We want to be talking more intimately about it because. Yeah, yeah. Because otherwise, what are we talking about? But yeah, if, if yeah, hold your questions, and we'll come to questions after um, Peter's Peter's response. Yeah, I'll be brief. I don't think I've said either of the things you want to disagree with me about, so I have a problem. I wasn't um, listening. I was just asking questions. I mean, just I don't say anything about societies without commodities. <laughs> you said something about. Commodities in societies without capitalism, which is a different thing. Um, it also means that artists don't engage with the commodity either. So, the thing is, they don't. My, my, posi my position is that they're in a structurally contradictory position. Yeah. Oh, in yeah, which they have to limit their own, the way in which they relate to the commodity form of their own work <coughs> is that they have to limit the freedom of their own work in such a way as to make it uh, distributable. But they have to do that in such a way that that limitation itself appears as a form of their freedom, yeah. right? So, I mean, just to reduce it to one sentence, which will undoubtedly be unintelligible to do something like this, um, <laughs> it's very simple. I don't think it's, by the way, the reference to the unintelligible is going to come right Oh my god! That's so I'm talking about reps. He's the one who claims he doesn't understand. He's defending himself. He's allowed to. <laughs> Rex is the one who claims not to understand it. He's an old, uh, old rhetorical uh, form. Um, uh, my, my position is very, very simple, which is simply that it's a contradictory uh, structure and that the power and critical status of works depends upon the specific form of the negotiation of that contradiction. But if you don't think, realize it's contradictory, in other words, if you think you can do art in a romantically individualistic, bourgeois, free way, then you basically haven't got much chance. And if you think there is, if you like, only uh, commercial art, then you haven't got much chance either. So it's just a way of delineating the space where you determine, if you like, how you go about negotiating that contradiction, doesn't it? I agree with that. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so now we'll take, um, take some questions from the audience. Um, also, sorry, I was thinking like to, to perhaps like if you could address this one of these questions in the panel discussion. Um, that always for all the panelists, but um, I was just thinking like, um, must art seek emancipation from from the commodity form, or is it at hold? Is it at, or is it at home in it? Um, and then you were, we were talking about um, like. Um, Communicating with your artists that like you didn't want them to feel like their work was being sold, or like modifying them as individuals, individuals, and the importance of cheap studios uh, for allowing them, um, allowing the space for politics to take place in their work. And then this is kind of followed by the other question: What sense does art take place in the left and emancipatory politics, if at all? Um, can you just think about that? And then maybe we'll take like a couple questions from the audience, and then um, yeah. So if I could go, if I go with James. Uh, I've had a, a couple of questions come to me. One is, I, I, I can't believe there is a Marxist theory of art. It seems like a really daft idea to me. Um, like a, a Marxist theory of geology or of astronomy, I think it's a kind of misunderstanding, so I'm a bit curious about that. Um, 
I, I, I can't really see the massive constraint either. You know, the, the fine art market's been in a pretty massive boom since the kind of mid-80s, a bit of income in 2008, but it was very short. In fact, all luxury production has been really off the chart for uh, the last kind of 20 years. Um, and um, you have to be really bad artists not to be able to sell stuff. Uh, in modern conditions, I think it would be you know, the worst artists in the world that would sell stuff. Uh, and uh, you have no idea about the market or uh, the commodity form, certainly they're complete aliens to it, and yet it keeps dropping in their lap. Um, and um, uh, yeah, thankfully, lots of good stuff gets done. So I, I can't see this massive constraint. It seems like a really great time. And uh, capitalism, far from being the enemy of art, seems to provoke this tremendous art surge of creativity. Oh, God, I can imagine all that's all being peasants working in a way full of artistic meaning as we're wiggling away. God, that'd be brilliant. <laughs> Whereas, you know, I can go everywhere and see David Shrigley, yeah, I'm sure you know the damn stuff. It's too much of it. Um, so I can't see it. I think it's you know, boom time for artists, and, um, and capitalists have done really good by them. Can I? Yeah, yeah I, would love, I would love to respond to it. Okay, um, so you're talking about the blue chip world, which is all the Sorry, big. You're talking about the blue chip gallery world, <laughs> which are, you're right, booming, killing it. Like, David Shrigley you know, whatever, Anish Kapoor, all of them loving it. They are making cash. Um, the problem is that all of the institutions, like, you know, the Tate, British Art Council, all of those, they are getting less money from the Tory government, drastically reduced funding. So that means that all of those institutions have to go out, like the rest of galleries, and find patrons, or ultimately rich people, who don't give a shit about art, but who love Picasso. So what you have is a major disconnect between the emerging galleries such as us and these blue chip spaces. So now we are having to, because if we want to keep like some sort of ideology and show work that we think is very important to the progress of contemporary art, we need to do things differently. Um, there's no money. There is a tiny, 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 tiny. If you think of like, I don't know, like the one percent or whatever, and then like think of that section of people who collect art, reduce that by like eighty percent, and that's the amount of people, ninety-five percent, and that's the amount that collect contemporary art. So, that's true. yeah. So. But they're very rich. Those ones. It's a very small pool, and <coughs> it like requires. The other thing as well is. What, where does an emerging gallery go? This is a question for, for us and all emerging galleries. Where are you meant to go when you have blue chip galleries then poaching your artists once they've shown at the tape, once they've shown at big institutions? Where do, what do we do then? Like, you know, do you know what I mean? It's, yeah, so there's, trust me, there's no money in the emerging art market. But I mean, you're right, in, in, yeah, in the blue chip world, it's great, yeah. Take a question from okay from Garth Garth's yeah <laughs> sorry sorry <laughs> um yeah um I thought what you said about technology as being a sort of liberatory practice for your arts was really interesting I'd like to focus on the form of the commodity form in the sixties when you had things like happening or like um, uh, you know performance art that they were specifically forms designed to resist modification but now you can buy Buy a video, you can buy an XYZ. Um, as Pat or like, do you think that like the form in which the art takes place like necessarily has to? You know, I, I'm trying to drive away from this like form and body form. Is this like, necessarily negative kind of thing? Like, if if the practice for an artist, like you said, being sensitive that is liberal and it also sounds, you know. What is the, you know, where do you define value in that? You know, I, I'd like to hear more about you know, different forms. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think like when you talk about like happenings and artists from that generation, I mean, a lot of those artists sell prints from those, you know, like they, it's like, you know, idealistically, you know, you could say like Yvonne, Yvonne Rainer, for example, like, you know, oh, you know blah, blah, blah. but those videos are for sale and those, you know, the documentation is also. Um, 
but in terms of, like, do you mean like where the art market is now? So like in, so to say like a performance versus a painting or a video versus a whatever. Right, so as we, as we develop new technologies and as initially they, they, they're used for laboratory practices to escape economy or what have or to capture what the, their mission is in a pure form. Um, are we running out of places where you know things can't be commodified? It, does that really matter? I, I, I'm saying I think that there's case to be made such that regardless of what form we take, as long as the message contained within it uh, has the attack for inspiration for the return practices, whether or not it can be modified, and it seems that everything, everything can be modified, get to, et cetera, you know, where do you see that going? Where do you well, I mean, yeah, I, I have no aversion to modification. Um, I, I think that um, you're right, like, if the work is important, if it's, if it's good, as long as the artist is feeling comfortable with the work that they're making and, and, they, and they believe in what they're making and they, they don't feel uncomfortable with... Um, well, so I'm, just, I'm just touched by the fact that you don't want artists to feel uncomfortable. They seem such, oh my God. such sensitive beasts. <laughs> they are. <laughs> do, do you think these really comfortable artists might be too They're not comfortable. <laughs> this is the problem. Like being an artist, like I mean, being an artist is a hard. Like this is going to sound ridiculous because it's like being in the army is a hard job. Being a doctor is a hard job. Being a surgeon is a hard job. But being an artist is a super difficult job. It's psychologically difficult and like. You know, you're alone all day, and you are there to think. But you, just, you know, it's a hard job. Of course, it's a hard job, but I, I don't see. I don't, I'm being and accused as you know, of conflict. As as, no, no, no. As a gallerist, you want to be. You want your artists to be able to almost exist within a space where they feel complete creative freedom, where they can express their complete creative freedom. And you can't do that if you're living in like the real world. Okay. Well, well, I, don't believe, I don't believe in complete. I don't believe in complete creative freedom. Complete creative freedom is complete indeterminacy. People have no idea. So no idea what to do. Um, yeah. When you see the contradiction talking about the patrician way about what does that mean? Well, you're in charge, right? You're allowing freedom. Allowing the freedom. Well, I think that way. It seems very patronizing. Okay. Okay. Cool. Do you want to respond to this? Because I'm going to have to do it. Yeah, and I, I think it's unfair to these people actually, but these two have already jumped in. I'm, I'm, re re I'm keeping my silence out of respect for these people, so I would like to come back at some stage. Yes, if you could come back now and then we'll take another question. Well, it's not fair to these people. <laughs> Let them have a go first, and then I'll come back later. Okay, Mike, is it Michael? Yes. Same question from you. Can I just try and reframe slightly the discussion which has just happened, which I think is really interesting, and I think it's interesting. And bring together two elements. One of the things is the structure of Arcadia Lissa as both a project space and a commercial gallery, which I think is really interesting and has partly to do with, you know, the sort of gradual collapse of public public funding for spaces. So how do spaces continue as project spaces without supporting information? The other thing is the Marxist sort of framework, theory, whatever. And the question there, for me, would be to what extent does the idea of the modification of art depend on some notion of unalienation, like unalienated labor, or freedom that's restricted somehow by the commodity? To bring the two things together, I would ask how does, how artists deal with this situation? What does that tell us about that question of commodity and alienation or unalienation? And I'm thinking in particular of two artists with Arcadia Missa, Anna Black, who has been here quite a bit the last couple of weeks and speaking, and Jesse Darwin. Now, both of them produce objects, and both of them produce objects that sell. They also both I think, perform themselves as artists. I and mean, I don't think they're these sort of fragile creatures that necessarily need to be protected or made comfortable by the gallery. In fact, they perform themselves as artists in ways that are quite uncomfortable and can make the audience uncomfortable. 
I don't see behind that performance some idea of an unalienated or essential artist that is somehow compromised by the performance. There's not necessarily anything other than that performance of themselves as artists. Um, and that is, in, in fact, you know, it, it may be both critical of the context and of the qualifications, but also made possible by it in a certain way, as is the work. Okay. So, you know, that's really the question. What does that sort of self-positioning or self-performance of the artist in that context or contradiction tell us, in a sense, about the Marxist theory, rather than the Marxist theory necessarily framing who or what those artists are or, or might be. If I could get Rex yeah. down to respond to this first, and then we'll come across the panel. Thank okay. Um, right, there seems to be some strong objection to my notion of a Marxist theory of art, which I, I made a very, very clear distinction between a Marxist theory of art, which I think is necessary in order to if we believe in human freedom, which we don't have at the, at the moment, then I think the idea of a Marxist theory of art, because it is a different, or was historically, a totally different kind of labor, I refer to what was going on uh, earlier in the 20th century with the rise of ascetic modernism. Um, it is an expression of desire for human freedom, and if we believe that that is important, then we would not have such an instrumental view of art, which you seem to be putting forward, at the end of the day, the evidence that you gave for uh, uh, art, which is booming under capitalism, um, basically you're talking about the market, and as I said, the, it, it is the price of the art object which determines its value, uh, not the quality of the artwork itself. And I think you are glossing over these facts. Um, now, the, the artist, I think, and there are lots of people around, and they're obviously working for you, and I I applaud that. I think they are the sort of people I'm talking about who do have this aspiration to be free. They want to affirm themselves through the making of a work of art which involves um, work. I'm sorry to use that, but I would rather call it not work, but aesthetic labor, which is totally different from someone working at a factory or even someone working um, uh, a skilled worker who's using uh, internet technology and what have you, what they are doing is trying to find the right form in order to express the content of their work, whatever that might be. And this is what I mean by the free play of uh, both the physical and the psychic faculties of the individual. And I think there are lots of people around today who aspire to be that, but they are being suffocated by the art market, and you are, you know, providing a brave uh, stand in opposition. But it's, a, you know, it's it's actually a bit like putting your finger in the wall of the dike. Unfortunately, if it, if it was the other way around, um, it would be great. But it's not like that. I'm saying that the only way in which we can achieve human freedom, which at the moment, um, or certainly historically, I, I would certainly use the example of say Van Gogh, who never sold a single painting in his life, became one of the great artists because he transformed art through his um, view of the world through expressionism, and now, of course, uh, his art is only seen as uh, something to be sold as a commodity. It's sold for millions and millions of dollars at various art auctions, and that is not what Van Gogh was trying to do. He was trying to express himself as a human being. He was trying to, uh, he was, he was trying to achieve freedom as an individual, and he wanted other people to appreciate that. Now, that's what I mean, and, and if you want to have an instrumental view of art, and you only want to talk about the art market is today, and so on and so forth, that is really reducing the argument, and to use uh, uh, such uh, words as a Marxist approach, Marxist orthodoxy, and so on, I think, is a, is a distraction from what we're really talking about. And I'll leave it there. I was going to say something about technology. I think you understood me. I'm not opposed to technology and the combination or the use of technology in order to make art. I'm a huge fan of people like John Hartfield who used technology in the 1930s to produce um, wonderful uh, montages which were opposed to the Nazi regime using fantastic imagination, using the resources that were available to him at the time in order to create really powerful anti-Nazi work, you know, which we still admire today. Okay. Um, yeah, you're right. They're doing more superficialism. I'm so sorry. Um, it was more talking about, I think comfortable is the wrong word, but it's like 
we provide a platform as a gallery. That's just what we do. So you're right, with Hannah and Rosie, incredibly strong people, incredibly intelligent, can, you know, ultimately sell themselves. So then I guess the question is what our role is in that. Um, and our role is ultimately to deal with framing them in the right way. So as a gallery, we also do publications. Um, every year we do different journals um, where we look at different things we've been thinking about um, and get writers and critics to contribute. So you are right. There is. It's almost like we are getting to a point where artists could stand alone. And I do know artists who are able to you know, go out and work it every night of the week, you know, go to everything and and really promote their own work. But they do have gallerists because at the end of the day they need that platform for the commerce to take place. Um, yeah. I think I was more so thinking about how the structure of the both project space <coughs> actually sustains and makes possible the way that they deal through their performance of themselves with their, as it were, contradictory Situation. So mm. Well, they're both more yeah. strongly in favour of your gallery than you are in some way. No, what do you mean? I'm like the biggest fan. Um, um, yeah, no, I mean, uh, I think the thing is with, yeah, I mean, they're both very prolific. They make work and it's important. They're talking about really, really important topics at the moment, um, particularly to do with uh, gender issues and also. You know, they work. So, I mean, yeah. I, I, I'm saying also, so there's no unalienated labour, and there's no freedom before or outside mm. constraints. I think mean, that's the yeah. implication. You're saying that the artist himself is a commodity form. What? You're saying that the artist himself is a commodity form. Hannah yeah. Black is a commodity. Or performing a relation to it. So. Can I just take a response from Peter, and then we'll come to a question from Lucy? I mean, I, I think the question. You know, what, what is the model of free labour right? change? Because, because obviously in the, you know, the 19th century, the model of free labour that you get in Marx is essentially a kind of warmed up late 18th century romantic model of free labour. It's based on craft labour. Right? Um, but obviously after the First World War, I guess, would be late enough. Craft labour is no longer a model of artistic power, at least for what then was avant-garde art labour and now is normal art labour, right? I mean, that whole narrative of de-skilling um, that John Roberts tells in his book about, you should know, I mean, the connection of de-skilling, the de-skilling, the social de-skilling of labour to the emergence of conceptual art. I mean, I think that narrative is right. But what, what it means is that the model of free labour becomes a certain kind of free thought, becomes the capacity to actualize a certain kind of free thinking. Right? Because the model of free labor is no longer craft, it's no longer manual. The model of free labor is conceptual. Right? And once the model of free labor is conceptual, um, then the parameters, the parameters change. But the problem is that the social archetypes and self-identities of artists and their reproduction through art schools are incredibly archaic regarding images of free labour and their relations to materials, right? I mean, because the market requires that, that artists that want to go to the market have these 19th century views about craft labour, right? I mean, that's, part of, that's become part of the commercial art world. But, 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 it hadn't, but no serious artist has thought about art labour like that for 50 years, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm sure another question. Yeah, sure. Um, it may or may not follow on from this. Um, I, I guess I wanted to come back to um, uh, the historically specific uh, character of both art as a concept and uh, uh, commodity form of, um, of labour. I, 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 I would perhaps agree with your, um, your query over the beginning part of our description but I, I would kind of and so I think yes the commodity form of labour um, power uh, in capitalism uh, 
from a Marxist perspective, as I understand it, is 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 the driving uh, force for the reproduction of capitalism. Um, so, given that, I, I just want to sort of push a little bit what what I think is a contradiction. I think we've seen kind of the two sides playing out in resistance from, on from, from one side of the contradiction or the other of the question of freedom in capitalism. That um, actually there's a the the, the process of um, alienation and alienated labour actually um, allows for a new kind of um, uh, reflection on one's own labour. Um, and so I just wanted to hear from speakers what they thought about this. This, this idea of unalienated labour, I think that there is that, that expresses some kind of desire for um, a resistance to alienation, but I think probably the artists selling themselves is an incredibly mediated um, sort of process. So I just wondered if people could respond a bit to that. And I guess just to bring it back to this, um, to also the question of art per se, um, whether, you know, I mean, the, there's been change within capitalism, maybe you can talk about that, but whether there's something specific to capitalism or modern society about um, an idea of art, per se. Here we go. Come in on. That was like a million oh. different questions. Sorry. <laughs> I got more, but I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, okay. Who wants to have a go? Yeah. Do you think there's something um, specifically. Uh, do you think the way we understand when we talk about art today, um, is there a. Is that specific to the kind of society that we live in or uh, does does could we could we read back art on to the whole of the history of humanity or is there something specific about how art how we understand art now um, could I ask Zoe maybe first and then no. oh, sorry, sorry. Zoe first I'm sorry yeah. alright women are smarter though so. Um, <laughs> um, so I would say that no art can be made without historical context um, in that respect um, so in terms of I guess what I was saying before about the use of technology and that's as a space or a platform for expression is like uh, what I would see as uh, possibly a way forward but um, yeah no art can be made in a without historical context um, I think but has, has, it, has it changed? Do we have uh, what? do we have a concept of art now today that has always existed, or is it or is it somehow new or specific to our type of society? Yeah, I mean the fundamentals are the same, but obviously, sociopolitically, everything's changed. I mean, or well, everything continues to change, but um, slowly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that would be like a better question for an artist. <laughs> but no, um, it's, yeah, definitely. Um, it, I think the same modes of uh, production um, exist, obviously. But um, yeah, content has changed. Well, I agree with what you said, so I'm glad you went first. Um, <laughs> uh, basically, I agree with what you said. I'd just like to say a bit more. Um, first of all, um, this uh, notion that Marx um, defined art as, uh, in some sort of romantic way, as uh, craft work is complete nonsense. Um, what I'm really trying to get at, and perhaps not explaining myself very well, is that okay, there is an historical context for art, but also there is something which is eternal about the making and appreciation of art, which is the uh, one particular philosopher, I think of a Schiller, to, uh, defined art as a play. And I see this as a play between um, ideas and and what the artist wants, how the artist sees the world, how the artist wants to express the way he feels or she feels about the world. And in order to do that, they have to find a particular form in order to express the content. And this is 
what Marx uh, and Ingalls, if you look at their correspondence about art, and I think if they had have lived long enough, they would have developed a, a Marxist theory of art, because it is about essentially about human freedom. That's why it's so important. Um, but if you look at their correspondence about art, they're not talking about um, the artist as a craftsman. They're talking about, particularly with regard to literature, which was their great love, rather than fine art, although when the young Marx was very interested in fine art, but the mature or the old Marx, um, when he was living in Britain and corresponding with Engels, they talked mainly about literature. And what they were talking about was this relationship between form and content. And they criticized uh, a friend of theirs at the time, La Salle, who was uh, uh, a socialist and a member of the international for a while until they um, began to disagree about the way forward. But at this particular time, they were friends, if you like, comrades within the, within the international. Um, La Salle wrote a play called Franz von Sickingen, and in this play, he used his characters as a mouthpiece for his political ideas, which was criticised strongly by both Marx and Engels. At the same time, they praised a, a bourgeois author called Eugène Sue, who was writing for the French market, um, in which he developed a character, his main character was a woman, and he, Marx said this woman had more vitality and, and therefore was somehow showing that human beings want to be free, even under capitalism, and therefore Eugène, Eugène Sue, who was not a um, not a socialist like LaSalle, the, what he wrote was better, qualitatively better, than LaSalle's play. Now, this is, this is what I mean by getting at the essence of what Marx and Engels mean about art. It is about the relationship between form and content in order to produce, to produce uh, an object uh, which is impractical in the sense it doesn't have a particular function, such as a poem, a book, a, a novel, um, a painting, um, a, a play, and so on and so forth. It doesn't have a, a particular function, but it does illuminate us, and, and it should um, make us appreciate the way in which this product was made, and also appreciate the ideas that are being expressed, particularly um, notions of human freedom. I, mean, I, I completely agree with it's about freedom. I, mean, I think the problem is but the model of freedom is de alienation or disalienation zone is no longer convincing because we know because the, the concept of the self that's involved in the concept of freedom as de alienation presupposes a kind of fully possessed self relation which, which is just not uh, well, it's not theoretically plausible to one who's ever encountered psychoanalysis and it's not uh, it's not intuitively plausible to people who live in uh, modern capitalist societies because they don't uh, they have much more complicated and fractured and unknowing relations to themselves than this. We don't relate to ourselves in the way in which their 19th century model um, presupposes anymore. We have much more problematic relations to ourselves. Right? So the question of what our freedom is is profoundly problematic. Uh, I and mean, the problem that there's a, there was a politics in which it seemed clear what freedom was, and the question was, how did you get it? Right? Uh, it's not so clear what freedom is. It's clear what oppression is, but it's not quite so clear what the positive content of freedom is if it's not the de alienation. Uh, I think that, that's a problem. I don't think we know what freedom is, right? Yes, I do. I do. Uh, I, I know you do. Yeah. That's oh, the 19th no, century. I think that that's interesting. Because, like, as people of privilege, how can we even dictate what freedom is? Well, I don't just anyone dictating. I'm just suggesting that. Well, like Marx. There, there, is, there, is no, there is no current plausible <laughs> philosophical idea of freedom. Right? Also, as well, like, why does freedom have to be a space that art, uh, like, art is born out of? Isn't it more the opposite? Isn't oppression what art is often born out, born out of? I mean, generally. I don't think anyone says art is born out of freedom. That's not the point. Yeah. Yeah. Then how does this relate to art? Because the traditional claim is that the art is a, a manifestation of freedom, which is born out of unfreedom. Did you want to come back quickly? Yeah. yeah. I just wondered if, if, if this, this, this difficulty with the concept of a concept of freedom today, whether ha- what people might on the panel might attribute that to, if it is to do with something that Rex brought up at the beginning, a failure of leftist politics? And if so, when? When did that failure occur? 
Stalinism, the rise of Stalinism. 1935. <laughs> <laughs> or whether they're, 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 it's a product of different failures. <laughs> um, people are asking if I have a definition of freedom, or is there such a thing as a definition of freedom? Uh, you seem to be saying, you seem to be saying that we're going to live in the permanent darkness of alienation, yeah. and there's no aspiration um, for what you call this alienation or freedom. I, I oh, think that different. I think that when human beings reach that stage, they are simply going to become automatons and they're going to be something like in the movie Blade Runner. You know, you can't decide which are the automatons and which are humans. We have to put them to some sort of test and decide whether they're human or not. If they're not, we can eliminate them. That seems to be the kind of future you seem to be suggesting, and I'm <laughs> utterly opposed to that. Um, if you want a definition of freedom, um, it is the freedom of each. The freedom of each is a condition for the freedom of all. And that is absolutely impossible under capitalism. And that is what we should be striving for. If you want to know when the revolution was betrayed, it was betrayed by Stalinism. And I explained why Stalinism came about. It has nothing to do with 1935, right? And as far as the artist is concerned, the artist in his or her own way is aspiring to be free, as I said, by playing around with form and content. If they're not doing that, they're not artists. They define free or are. They're not, that's the opposite of what it is. Okay, we're going to come to another question from the audience. Rubbish. Can I take a question from Stan, Stanley? Yeah. Um, right, uh, this question's addressed to uh, all three of you simultaneously. Um, a bit louder. Uh, this question's addressed to all three of you simultaneously. And I think you might have to sort of clarify your respective positions on that. Um, well, it's okay. Uh, um, if you could, um, oh my god, my passion is very simple. Um, like, uh, can you name an uh, exemplary critical artwork today? Um, because uh, I think that would be very helpful to bring out uh, the, you know, your ideas of the relationship between politics and art. Uh, and secondary question is it, is it, uh, what does it mean for our work to be critical uh, if indeed this is even possible today? Uh, because I mean, uh, from, from, from what race to sound like maybe the, the last like, sort of the last moment that was possible was like you know Pavlovich or Rochenko or, or something. So like, but the so you obviously like seem to have you obviously invested in the idea that the, the art still can have a sort of critical power. So much. <laughs> okay, okay. You, want to, you want to come back? Yes, first. Yeah. Um, so yeah, obviously I believe that. Otherwise, I wouldn't. I would kill myself. <laughs> um, so I, the first one that springs to mind is because I was talking about that Russian billionaire before, <laughs> um, and the work that they bought was a piece by um, a young artist Stewart who we represent. Um, the piece of work is called Double Income No Kids. D A N K. Um, and it's a CGI rendering, like a large light box piece um, that is a depiction of Fire Island, which is of, um, just off New York. Um, and it's almost like a dystopian vision of their island post sort of like a natural disaster. Um, and the image is incredibly like arresting in the way that it's very melancholic. And it, it also shows, um, so Hannah and Rosie, their practice at large speaks to the diminishing nature of queer spaces. So that's due to gentrification and things like that. So that work, I think, because Fire Island is being destroyed as an island very gradually over time um, because of hurricanes and stuff. But essentially, it is a sand bank. Um, that's the perfect analogy for the way in which queer spaces are being removed from uh, yeah, the world. That's, yeah. Did you want to come back to this? Oh, I can give it an example. I'll just. I'll just I made the example of what I wrote about recently because otherwise it becomes a majority because it's like if you choose an example it sounds like it's better than anything else which is absurd. Yeah, yeah there's so like, it's, so it, 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 it's kind of random so it's just things that I've been written about, writing about because I've been asked to uh, are the artists who work with the Bay Ridge, the Bay Ridge Foundation Archive because I'm interested in the relationship between the documentary materials and art and whether that's been reworked because I don't think art is eternal or universal or being the same. I mean, in a, in a very general way, it changes 
in the 19th century, but more recently, it's also changed fundamentally. For example, I mean, the, the integration of documentation into art uh, as a practice, as, if you like, a, as a relational practice, completely changes a lot of things. So I'm interested in, in, in the very image foundation because there are various artists who use the archive, I mean, like I and other people. I'm interested in the indeterminacy about the form of those materials as they circulate through different works and back in the archive. And also the fact that the entire archive is formally speaking stolen and a lot of families would like it back. <laughs> right, I get to go now. Uh, you want to know, are there any contemporary examples of well, uh, artistic freedom? Is that what you mean? Well, I mean, such a long time since you asked your question. I, I was saying, like, um, so, so obviously, uh, I want to answer. Is that, is that the question, basically? Uh, I want to give. Yeah, exactly. yeah, you want some examples of artistic freedom today? What yeah? would be, what would be an, exemplary, an exemplary critical artwork today? Um, ah. Uh, yeah, I can give you two. One is... Uh, what does it mean to be critical? First of all, first of all I, I would say that this is something which is eternal in terms of the human aspiration for freedom in relation to art, which is um, um, beauty is form and ugliness is the absence of form. And if the artist is working even instinctively within this framework, then they're more likely than not to produce a work of art. And two examples. One is um, from Land Art. Uh, is the guy that built, he's very rich by the way, and that's a bit of a problem because most of us are not rich, but he's built this this building which doesn't have a roof but it has a square hole in it and you can go inside it and you can look at what's passing over your head in terms of what nature is doing with regard to the weather and with regard, you can also do it at night, you can watch the stars at night and so on. I think that is absolutely beautiful. He's using the square as well as nature or the weather itself in order to nature itself by means of a square which is made by a human being is creating something which is absolutely beautiful. For me that is a work of art. And on the other hand if you want to look at um, the work of art and also using technology I would say all of the movies made by Ken Loach who by the way is on the radio at the moment on Radio 3 talking about his work are all about human beings who are resisting the system and wanting to be free. And that's He's using the craft, if you like, of filmmaking. He's using actors. He's using uh, camera uh, persons. He's using uh, people who design the sets and so on in order to create a film which is, in a way, uh, although it's, uh, it's, 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 it has a political message, it is uh, a, a work of art because he's, he's articulating, he's showing us what only people want, which is their desire to be free. And in order to be free, you've got to resist the system. Can I just say one thing, just to clarify, I'm worried that, that it came across wrong before. Um, I don't believe that techn technology, using technology or the internet or whatever is the future of um, saying important socio-political things in art. Um, very often using craft, use, it doesn't... Materiality is important to a certain extent, but it's the conception of the work and the ideas behind the work that, that carry the, the weight of the contemporality, is that a word? Contemporary. Contemporary. Is there anything? Well, Contemporary. Rex, Rex, what happens when um, resistance itself becomes uh, accessible? Uh, well, well, that is something that I said in my opening remarks that art cannot resist commodification, cannot resist ideology, but it can get close to this alienation or um, the artists will have uh, a sense of freedom because they have done something. I should imagine every time Van Gogh finished a painting he felt as though he'd done something which was worthwhile but he wanted to show the world and he had a sense of being free because he created a new reality which, is, which was the painting which is something using the materials at his disposal which is absolutely beautiful. Um, not understood in his own time, certainly appreciated as something absolutely beautiful. Yes, yes. So art cannot escape commodification. doesn't mean we have to we should not struggle to resist commodification, which is what my big quarrel with you. That's the autonomy art. Right? Pardon? That's the autonomy art. Stand up that autonomy. It's, it's only, art only has a relative yeah. autonomy. So how does that fit with Lisa's thing about um, we don't have a sense of self in the same way anymore? I mean, I'm sure Vincent Van Gogh didn't either, but now it's kind of fusion, right? <laughs> <laughs> rubbish. <laughs> sense of self, absolute rubbish. If we take another question from the audience, if I could take a question from the back. Yeah. Hi. Um, this is a question in relation to art as anti-capitalist practice. Um, 
and, and to both and both to think about the terms of quantification. Um, well, first of all, I'm a Marxist and, uh, and I'm not strictly white, so I don't want to say that it's white and Marxism is only for uh, or old. Uh, white. Yeah, I'm not old. Man. I have to admit that. You're the future. Uh, I wouldn't say that it was only for, for white men at all. I, I think it's for anyone who, who wishes to, to challenge uh, the relations of production that they have in front of it. And, 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 uh, and it's a methodology by which one can change the world. It might be um, my, my question um, is to do with um, uh, pro proletarian culture and, and, this, uh, and this notion um, of how we can use art to to emancipate ourselves and, and whether and whether it, it can and, and that's something that you talk about as an act in itself, I mean material and physically, not just for the self and for discrimination of the self, I mean material and physically. Um, but uh, I was wondering what you what you guys thought about it. Um, Trotsky writing in his um, his book Literary Revolution about proletarian culture, he was saying that um, it proletary culture isn't the thing, it can't be the thing, it's not desirable for it to be the thing because um, the proletariat should be entirely consumed in, in, in struggle against capitalism. Um, and then at the time uh, when when they will be able to create proper culture in the way that the bourgeoisie is going to create the culture, they will cease to be the proletariat. Um, mm. I was just wondering what you think about that because I don't entirely agree with trust is, um, but I wouldn't entirely agree with that because I think that uh, proletarian culture can be uh, uh, a health force uh, against uh, I'll see you've read Jotrotsky. I'm um, great. Um, literature and Revolution. Um, what you say basically is a very good summary of his position, I think, which is uh, there's no such thing as proletarian art because uh, of the division of labour and the proletariat um, was not part of that division of labour where it had the freedom and the opportunity to create art. Um, and also it doesn't understand the art of the past and in order to create a new art in, in a social society it would have to uh, it would have to have through uh, the abolition of the division of labor which means everyone has uh, is educated as a whole individual as I said before then they would have this uh, appreciation of the past and also an understanding of how to express themselves and make art objects in the present um, I there were examples, of course, of proletarian art at the time, which uh, were strongly criticized by Trotsky because um, they uh, believed that art um, should be instrumental, whereas I put forward a totally different point of view. I think art should be an end in itself. I may not have expressed that very well, but that is my position, which is why I mentioned um, you know, artists being painters, among other things, in a communist society. Art is not instrumental, that's the thing. And the uh, proletarian art wanted art to have an, an instrumental function and play an equal part in socialist construction, which um, led to all sorts of horrific uh, uh, examples of proletarian art, such as factory whistles um, being um, somehow blown in unison, and that would be an example of proletarian art. Uh, people wearing new kinds of clothes, that was supposed to be a new kind of art. Um, again, it's this instrumental, instrumental approach to art, which... Um, uh, Trotsky quite clearly said is, is a total misunderstanding of what art is about. Um, well, I'm not sure that the concept of proletarian culture has any applicability in contemporary capitalism in the sense that there is no cultural unity to collective labour. I mean, if you, I mean, if you, if you believe you know, in, in Marx's later concept of the collective worker, you know, the worker, the collective worker that produces more or less all of the commodities that you consume in everyday life is distributed across five continents, uh, you know, manufactured different, certain different parts is assembled in a, another place. The people that produce the um, elements of the commodity have completely different uh, cultural and political communities and they don't uh, if you like community, they don't communicate at the level of the unity of their labour, right? So, um, the, de the development of the international division of labour relative to individual commodities completely fractures the possibility of anything that could possibly be called proletarian culture. 
said, by that you mean the culture of the workers who produce the commodities that you consume. There is no cultural unity to those workers because they're completely global. My answer is really simple. Um, why make work if it's so conflictual with your political point of view? Why make art? I mean, like, if, if you can't make art about, yeah, like, your, if your political views contradict the actual act of making art, then why do it? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, like, if, if, you know, you guys are talking about the way in which, like, Marxist theory, like, contradicts the actual act of making art because it's, if you're a proletariat and then you you reach some sort of level of utopia and you can then become bourgeoisie or whatever and then that just detracts from the entire meaning of the act of uh, escaping capitalism, then isn't that contradictory to making art? It just seems like the it's like the internal conflict with what you believe in, in your own politics <coughs> contradicts with the act of making art. Well, I wouldn't have said that, but that's because we have been Yeah. Sorry, was that really intense? We can take another, another, another question. Is there a question? I could take... Someone in the hat, in the back. Yeah. Uh, just because we're talking about Bangor and he was part of the Bangor. You speak up a tiny bit. Um, yeah, you talk about Bangor being part of the Bangor and kind of the airways of this time because it transforms how our discovery. Itself. And do you think with the commodification of art, the avant art is, is dead because artists have, are preoccupied or have to take care of making a living and constantly being a I didn't hear you. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, I didn't do it. I mean, the modification of art is art because artists. I think it's charming. I think it's charming that we're talking about Van Gogh. I think it's just fantastic. Yeah, it's oh, yes. But you're saying it in a cynical way. <laughs> I am. <mean>, um, <laughs> <laughs> the problem. It's not commodification. Does. Do you like the you render the Van Gogh? The existence of the Van Gogh problematic. It's the non-existence of historical political movements, in other words, political movements aimed at historical change in the large scale sense. So it's a political problem, it's not an art problem. If I can answer this, um, this gentleman up here. Um, the, the problem is not the commodification of art, the problem is whether or not artists wish to struggle against the commodification of art. That's really the question. And I would say that uh, the art institution and the art market, which totally dominate the world of art, and you know, the exception, it's the exception that proves the rule, which is your position, which is absolutely fine. But we're talking here about the main direction of which art is going. And I think the postmodernism, uh, because it has abandoned the idea of aesthetic labor in order to create uh, an art object which has form as well as content uh, have completely abdicated uh, their position as artists. As I said, the emperor without his clothes. And if you uh, say that art is simply uh, a matter of producing something which is popular, is, uh, gets a lot of support in the media, creates controversy, is sensationalist and so on and so forth, yeah. and, and you manage to have an exhibition in your name and then you begin to sell your work, then you are a successful artist. For me, this is the end of art. Do you have a question? Yeah. We take this lady. lady up there. She yeah, she's fine going. This lady here. Thank you. Um, this is just a slight aside from, from what Marx was saying. But I'd like to say a couple of things that intrigue me when I was reading Marx. That uh, religion is a, an inversion of the unknown with the known, and we place the unknown on top. When capital took over and used labour power to produce, it was another inversion, and it inverted the worker, the labourer. 
uh, beneath the, the own, their own product. So capital, which is just the product, was deemed to take, uh, to command labor. So, or labor power. And it's this inversion, I think, that is the essential basis of the struggle we've got facing. And it's continuing today. And more and more, uh, this inversion is, is weakening. And you can see it in different ways. But the question of the art, well, I agree with what was said. But I'd just like to bring art back to what Raymond Williams said. Now, you might agree or disagree with what he said. But he did say something which has always struck me as being quite sensible. That we have to, and this is relates to what also uh, for the pumping. Human beings have to communicate, and he worked out that if you communicate in five ways, one is art in the broadest sense, graphic, um, non-verbal, or maybe slightly verbal, but it's essentially something that is seen. And another way that we communicate is language. The third way is through movement. Dance, he called it, which just means every form of human movement. A fourth way was, um, I can't remember, but a, a fifth way, oh, music. Music was another form of communication. Rand Williams emphasized that these are also not just products, but they're forms of communication. And they're developing all the time if we allow them. And the fifth was mathematics. And he saw these as essential to be mastered by everyone if we're going to live a full human life. So the, the education system has these forms of communication and use them to educate everybody, then surely they will develop a, a different kind of society. We don't have to. That's very idealistic. Mm -hmm. That's very idealistic, and I hope one day there will be a government that acknowledges that and allows for the education system to accommodate it. Yes. We will have to form the government. <laughs> well, us three. I mean, the people will have to form the government, not leave it to the so called political elite. Did you want to come back to this? Are there forms of communication? I'm very good. I don't think that attempt kind of, I mean, I, I understand what Williams was doing at the time, I don't think the attempt at a kind of transcendental anthropology of art elements really works anymore because it's completely dependent on a received system of the arts which no longer has any effective artistic existence. So distinctions between movement or dance, we would say dance performance, music, uh, the graphic or the visual, and then linguistic. These kind of, the idea that these are fundamentally separate human elements, it doesn't really make any sense in relation to contemporary art practices, where art practices aren't uh, compartmentalized according to those old fashion systems of the arts. Yeah, I mean, this goes back to the question about the fact that human subjects have become historically transformed rather radically by capitalist social relations. And we don't, we're not those kind of anthropological, humanistic, universal anthropological subjects uh, that relate to those elements of ourselves in that way. Uh, these are, I mean, I mean, it's an ideal. It's a, moral idea. it's a moral ideal masquerading as anthropology. I just said it was a form, these are forms of communication. It's how everybody communicates at some time of their life. Yeah, but the idea how of, they develop. The, the idea of dividing on the society. But the, the, the fact is that they're derived from one very specific European system of the arts that developed in the Renaissance on the basis of particular readings of Greek texts and went through to the after the Second World War, in which concepts like music, dance, fine art were, if you like, separated and if you like given some normative authority, but contemporary art practice doesn't operate internally to those kinds of divisions. I was, uh, I was reading, and I think I was just projecting a little bit, but when I 
when you when you were talking about that, I was kind of projecting that onto like primary education, um, like a, a basis for primary education, um, less so in a contemporary context. Uh, Faith and Brett, can you see quickly, and then we'll take a couple more questions from the audience, and then I think we can wrap up. It's just interesting that, um, well, government came up. I just wanted to ask, uh, it's quite late in the day, so thanks everyone for sticking with us, but I think this has been a really interesting discussion. Um, the question of the, the role of the state in relation to art production, and um, Zoe, you mentioned that, in a sense, a lot of large uh, arts institutes today that did have more arts council funding and now have to rely more on private donors, but... I just was reflecting back on um, the 1990s and this idea of kind of socially engaged art and um, uh, uh, that this was actually sort of in large part um, uh, sort of sponsored by this, by uh, state funding uh, and in fact you could almost not get funding from like a national arts council body unless you were going to do something socially engaged um, and I just wanted different speakers to maybe come back and either reflect on that or how um, how how the role of uh, the state has, has played a function in art production over, over time in capitalism. Um, another point in history might be the kind of New Deal in the US where lots of the kind of famous artists that we know about from abstract expressionism like Willem de Kooning started off being given like a, a that would be employed by the state and they had a, they had a job with enough free time to like make art, um, so Willem de Kooning, you know, was a painter and decorator, but he had like free time to make art. So uh, it, I just wondered, uh, uh, yeah, something about the, the contradictory character of um, the role of the state in art production in capitalism. I yeah, that's an answer. I mean. I think it's yeah, yeah. it's contradictory. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, obviously, it's it's a form of cultural management. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the the parameters of state funding have always been like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I mean, like, they generally want you know out for people. If 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 a government body is going to provide funding, it it is with the intention that it's going to be seen by a wider. Society um, outside of the art world um, that hasn't changed. But do you think do you think there's any problem with socially engaged art? Is is it is it like is it actually fulfilling a purpose or is it is it actually putting a band aid on a bigger problem in society? I don't know. I mean, like, I don't know. I don't want to be like diminutive, but it's like I just think of like all the people you see at Freys last <coughs> week, you know, just taking selfies in front of. Uh, and that's kind of, I think, represents a little bit where we're at in terms of uh, community funded projects. Um, but no, I mean, yeah, it, it is important for public funding to go to. But what happens, I mean, if you get public funding and it goes to, so Europe is a good example because they have consultors which um, get private funding and public funding. Um, and they have, they speak to more than just the art community, like Europe has a much different point of view when it comes to art, um, a wider range, like social strata go and visit councillors than over in the UK. Um, but, yeah. um, well, we're answering your question, isn't it right? First of all, I think three points, three quick points. First of all, one of the things state funding does although it is extremely limited, as I'll point out in a minute, it does um, give the artists, uh, if you like, some kind of income and therefore the freedom to create. And I think that um, art really must uh, come from uh, leisure time uh, rather than from work, although in a communist society work will become more aesthetic and life itself will become an end in itself, but we're not there yet. So um, uh, I think at the moment, you know, the artist needs a certain amount of freedom or leisure time to create works of art and that can sometimes come through state funding but of course since the financial crash of 2008 state funding I think in most western countries has been drastically cut and my final point is that and also there's a form of control that's my final point 
Um, even if there is state funding, it is a form of control. Certain kinds of people would not be selected, for example, to be given uh, funding in order to create something which might be uh, highly critical of the state or highly critical of something which um, of the system itself in particular rather than the state. So I think there are problems with state funding. If we could take, okay, if we take two more questions and then we can take final comments from the the panelists, if I can go here with Lucia. Um, I just wanted to follow up on um, the polemic against postmodernism put forward by uh, Rex, um, which is that it's formless and it's more form. Um, but I wanted to ask all the panelists what this conceptual desire for lack of form might express. Um, Rex had mentioned earlier, like John Parkfield as an example of montage being used to. Um, Combat ideologically uh, the Nazis. Um, I'm wondering what, why, why can't we look at the, the postmodernists as expressing some kind of uh, something about the state of human spirit in contemporary society, um, even though we have this drive for a lack of form? Because surely there must be some kind of form, otherwise we wouldn't be able to see the art. Any further questions here? Just to Zoe, in passing you mentioned progressing contemporary art. I'm just wondering if you could kind of elaborate just a little bit more on what you meant by that and what progress might mean. Mm, yeah, that's yeah. such a generalised statement, I was just going to say. Um, I think I mean more like um, figuring out a solution for the current economic state, basically, um, and allowing artists a platform to show their work. We are through art and in a, in a gallery space. Mm. And then if I could get the other panellists to, to respond to the first um, question. Yeah, I agree. There is only form. I mean, form. The form hasn't been about beauty for a long time, right? Um, form has become more. It's an aggression of the that express. Yeah. Yeah. But what does that express? What does it express? That form is about audience. Well, there's one, one thing that it's not the only thing to know. Form is a really big question. In a way, form is the question, right? uh, Because it's form that right? um, isn't sometimes the criterion uh, for something's art status. It's just that it doesn't follow traditional aesthetic theories. In fact, did you want to come back is this is something up. Pardon? This is something up. No, if you could just respond. Could you like, possibly just rephrase the question again? No, I'll, I'll, I'll um, pass. I don't need to something. I just have one thing to say. Yeah. Is that um, I think figuration is making a comeback. That's just a purely <laughs> aesthetic observation. It's a market tip. <laughs> <laughs> and I shouldn't have let that one go. And then maybe perhaps we could get like, a, a clo closing remark from each, from each panelist. Um, yeah, right, so do you, do you want to come in? Well, um, just to sum up in just a few words, really, because I've said too much and some of it I didn't put very well. I do apologise for that. Um, I would say two, two or three things about what art is or should be. One is that it's non-instrumental. It is a form of play uh, involving uh, how you can work out what kind of form in order to express the content of your work and that in itself is uh, free labour which is possible uh, today under capitalism uh, at least during the conception and making of the work um, and it is an expression of a human desire for freedom and fulfilment which is why we are what we are. We are social beings and we want to be free and we're not living in a free society at the moment and this is one of the things that art can do and certainly art at the moment and this kind of people you're dealing with are in a very privileged position because um, this aesthetic sensibility is denied um, the ordinary worker, certainly the wage labourer and that has also got an awful lot to do with the division of labour uh, within bourgeois society. The division of labour is utterly instrumental. It is intended um, to separate intellectual from practical labour uh, and the aim is to the accumulation of capital. And that is the real problem with regard to um, an earlier question about uh, proletarian uh, art. Um, it would take several generations, as Trotsky said, 
for um, this uh, problem of division of labor and, and the uh, development of the all-rounded individual is going to take several generations for that to happen, even in a uh, transitional society to communism. So this is a problem. This is Art, in a way, is in a privileged position, and there are lots of, unfortunately, there are lots of people who have submitted to the market, and that is a denial of art, and it means the end of art, as I said earlier, and, and, and it's a shame because of the sort of people that Zoe is talking about who are struggling to make art and are struggling in order to be free as human beings. And, of course, as I said, um, this is something which is denied the ordinary work and millions and millions of people who are simply um, trying to make ends meet. Um, I just want to acknowledge my position of privilege to be able to talk to everyone today. <laughs>